everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. The Fowler is proud to present today's program as part of our Lunch and Learn series, which offer easily digestible explorations of charismatic objects from around the world. We're pleased that you've joined us to chew on some sustenance and feed your mind and soul. The UCLA Dickey Bird and Mammal Collection houses more than 70,000 skins and skeletons of birds and mammals from the US, Canada, Mexico, Central America, and Pacific Islands. Today, we are pleased to welcome Blair Van Valkenburg, professor and curator, who will explain the Dickey Collection's history and share some highlights from the collection, a selection of which are currently on view in the map in the territory. Distinguished research professor Blair Van Valkenburg holds the Donald R. Dickey Chair in Vertebrate Biology in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UCLA. Her more than 112 publications explore the biology and paleontology of carnivorous mammals, such as hyenas, wolves, and lions. She is an honorary fellow of the California Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the Paleontological Society, and served as president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology from 08 to 10. Van Valkenburg has appeared in various television documentaries on prehistoric predators ranging from terror birds to saber-toothed cats and is a leading expert on the evolutionary biology of large carnivores past and present. Before we get going, I have a few quick technical bits of housekeeping. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options and then select side by side mode. And if you have any questions during this program, please submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, that's all from me. Over to you, Blair. Let me unmute myself, there we go, hi. <laughs> thank you to the Fowler for inviting me for, to give this presentation uh, and thank you all who are out there listening and thank you for coming and listening. So let's begin, let me share my screen and share and there we go. So I hope everyone can see that. So yes, I'm going to speak about the Donald R. Dickey collection of birds and mammals today, of which I am the curator, as it seems. So what is the Dickey collection? Yes, and it is more than birds. It's birds and mammals, as you can see those chipmunks in the background. Um, go forward, screen, go again. Ah, wait, back up, <laughs> there we go. Okay, the Dickey Collection is, as maybe it is, it's greater than 50,000, it seems to be 70,000 specimens of skins and skeletons of birds and mammals from the US and Canada and Mexico, Central America and the Pacific Islands. And it was first actually created in uh, the early part of the 20th century between 1920 and 1932 by Donald R. Dickey and then donated to UCLA after his death by his widow, Florence, in 1940. It is notable for being one of the best collections worldwide of birds and mammals of the American Southwest and also Central America. Um, the collection is used for teaching and research at UCLA, <clears throat> and researchers come from everywhere around the world to come use the collection and when they have a specific interest in a specific species, which we happen to have a sample of. Um, today, what I wanna accomplish is two things. I want to give you a bit of the interesting history of the collection of Donald Dickey himself, and then also what, explain um, why such collections are important and why we collect so many individuals of each species, because that's a common question. And as you can see in this slide, so we have skins, of foxes, which are in the lower left, and blue jays were in, were in the upper right, and then we have a student there working in the actual Dickey collection, and we also have osteological, we have bones, skeletons of a lot of um, mammals and birds as well, which is what's represented in the lower right there. That's an armadillo, in case you're wondering. All right, let's start with Donald Ryder Dickey, because he was a very interesting guy and very impressive. So you see his dates of uh, when he lived, 1887 to 1932, and you see him holding a large bat. And you also see some photographs to the right of wildlife, which he took. And Donald Ryder Dickey was born in Iowa, and he enrolled in Yale University with every intention to be a doctor and you know, work out, live a long life practicing medicine. And then suddenly everything went sideways in his senior year. He became ill and weak and tired, et cetera. And he was diagnosed with a serious heart condition. 
And in those days, there were no cures. So basically, you were just sent to bed rest, sentenced to bed rest. So he and I guess his family decided that he should do his bed rest in California. He came to California and up into the mountains of Ojai, where he had a small cabin and he had someone to help him. But he sat outside mostly all day, laying around on a steamer chair, noticing nature. <laughs> and he became enchanted with the birds and mammals and the, that he saw. And he started to try to take pictures, which was very, not many people did this back then. So he was one of the first people to do flash photographs of animals, both birds and mammals that he saw around his cabin. He used gunpowder to make the flash. So I don't think the birds ever came back after the first time they got photographed. But anyway, he was um, a very energetic, well, as much as he could be in that stage, but he took a lot of photos. And as it turns out, and he must've been reading a lot, after about three or four years, he got better. His heart recovered enough that he got his energy back. And he decided at that time that now he was dedicated to natural history, both photographing it and collecting it and building the first collection, natural history collection in Southern California. So that became his quest. And he felt he didn't have a lot of time left. So he was quite energetic about collecting. So in just 10 years, he put together a collection of over 30,000 bird and mammal specimens, a natural history library that has uh, 10,000 books, I believe, and thousands of photographs of, of his graphs. And he actually made movies as well. Now, the, the library and the photographs and films are all in the UCLA History and Special Collections a division in the biomedical library that you can visit online and also go see. And then the birds and mammal specimens, bones and the skins, et cetera, et cetera, ended up in the Dickey collection, which is currently housed within the ecology and evolutionary biology, biology department. And since he, it was given to us in 1940, it has grown, as you know, to, to double in size, basically, from what Don Dickey collected. But he was quite an amazing character. He, after his death in 1932, then his wife, Florence Van Becken Dickey, donated the collection to UCLA. And since then, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, the, what's happened with the collection, his books, his photographs, et cetera, could not have happened without the generous donations from his son, Don Dickey Jr., pictured here, and his wife, he say, also pictured. And unfortunately, Don passed about five, six years ago. But, They've been tremendously helpful in this collection in preserving both the photograph side and the specimen side of the collection. Okay, so that's the history of the collection. So now, why do we collect so many specimens of each species? Um, wouldn't it, wouldn't, you might think one or two would be enough and it, it isn't. And I'll give you some reasons why we collect so many. Originally with natural history collections, like hundreds of years ago, um, one of the, the primary reasons was because animals vary. Variation is a fundamental feature of species and provides the raw material for evolution as recognized by Mr. Darwin shown here. And you see an array of sparrows below there. And here is that same array of song sparrows. And these are all the same species, but you can see they vary considerably in their coloration, with some having a lot more streakiness on their breasts, some having almost none, and some in between. So because species vary, not only, and this is showing variation across geographic range in this species, but they'll vary within a species, uh, in, within any particular spot by sex. You have males and females that are gonna differ. You have juveniles and adults, or species, individuals of different ages that look different. So if you want to have a full characterization of the species, you really need to collect quite a few individuals to capture that. So that was the original reason uh, in large part. And what it does, oh, oh yes, so importantly here, so I said the variation is the raw material for uh, evolution on which evolution and natural selection can work. So by studying variation and studying how species change over time, if you have sequence, sequential collections over time, we can begin to understand how species evolve. We can see how new species are formed. And I'm gonna give you two examples from the collection of new species 
that formed relatively recently and nearby that we have specimens of. Yes, so we want to answer the question. Oh, yes, and so in case you're, this is not the Dickey collection. Ours is not this large. I believe this is probably the Natural History Museum of London. And it just gives you an idea of how impressive these collections are and how much information is contained within them. It's, it's mind boggling. Okay, the first, the first of these two species is, uh, are foxes. Um, the gray fox and the island fox. So the gray fox is a mainland species that some of you may have seen. It exists all over California, but the island fox is only found on the Channel Islands, which are shown here off the coast of uh, Santa Barbara and Los Angeles. And the island fox evolved on those islands and it apparently descended from, and we can tell this from the genetics and also the morphology, it descended from the gray fox, which is larger, um, it apparently descended from that, but a, they, a gray fox arrived on the islands probably between eight and 10,000 years ago. How it got, how they got there is not clear, maybe transported by uh, indigenous peoples, not clear. Um, but anyway, once there, they were isolated and they evolved in isolation from their ancestor. And they produced this adorable fox, which is about a third less the size of the mainland form and also is um, tame, basically, is not afraid of, of humans. So if any of you have visited these islands, especially Santa Cruz or Santa Rosa or San Miguel, you will often see these foxes and they're perfectly happy to uh, you know, perform in front of you to do their, <laughs> without running away because they're not afraid of people. They don't have any predators really on the island. Um, the second species that similarly, now we move to birds, is uh, the island scrub jay. So the island scrub jay is shown in the lower left, and it is a descendant of the California scrub jay shown up above. And the California scrub jay has a very widespread distribution and is the jay that we see in our backyards in Los Angeles. And somehow one of them, at least, well, two of them, we probably need two of them, two of them at least made it to these islands. But this time it was like 25,000 years ago based on the genetic data. And they never, and they then became isolated. And that might seem strange because they're birds. And so if you could fly there, why can't you fly back? But jays are actually really poor flyers. They don't fly long distances. So some, however, a couple of them got there, then once they were there, they didn't make it back. And so they have evolved in isolation on the islands like the island fox, and they have taken on a brighter blue color. And we don't know why that is, but uh, I don't think we have an answer to that, but yet, but um, they do, they are distinctive in the brighter blue plumage that they have um, relative to the mainland form. Okay, so those are two nice um, uh, evolutionary stories that we can use collections to define and um, document, but uh, maybe that still doesn't seem like a good enough reason to collect so many animals and put them in the museum. And so there are a lot of good reasons and let's look at those. And the main thing is, and looking at these, all these drawers open full of specimens, you have to think of these things and they are this, that natural history collections are libraries of biodiversity over time and space because we collect these species and sample samples from wherever they are in their geographic range. And we collect them decades, sometimes after decade or at various points in time. And that allows us to track changes over time that we could not see otherwise. And they're just libraries of this. So in this drawer, each of these birds, these are varied thrushes, each bird was, has associated with it a time, a date when it was collected and a place. So they represent snapshots in time of their ecosystem. And we can then use these snapshots, if we have multiple samples from different places and different times, to track various uh, changes. First of all, in the old days, it was mostly morphology. Are they getting bigger? Are they getting smaller? Are their beaks getting longer or shorter? Things such as that. But then this happened. The DNA and the molecular, the revolution in molecular biology has just blown apart the number of things. I mean, it just expanded the number of uh, things that we can find in these collections from each individual specimen and as collections themselves together. So using molecular biology and DNA techniques, we can of course assess genetic diversity, which is a measure of health of populations and how that changes over time. 
We can get inferences about diet from isotopic signatures that are within the animals themselves, their bones or their feathers. Um, we can study the arrival and spread of various diseases. We can see when hantavirus, where it first showed up, when it first showed up, then how it spread if we have good time series samples. Lyme disease, many other, any diseases can be, this can be done. And we can look at environmental contaminants and see how they have progressed or spread over time. So we can see the arrival or presence of pesticides, then the loss of pesticides, perhaps. We can look for lead and we can look for um, evidence of air pollution. And as this last one, I have one last example before we can move to questions. Um, in this case, I'm gonna, yeah, look at this slide. What we have here are four different species of birds a pair of individuals for each of those four species. And the numbers up above are the year they were collected. So on the left, this is a red-headed woodpecker. That's one that was collected in 1982. And that's the same species collected in 1901 in the same place. And likewise, the towies 2012 and 1906. And uh, those are larks, I believe 1966, 1904. And then sparrows on the end, 1996. And I can't see the date because my face is there at the moment, but okay. So what this is, is comparison of coloration in individual birds from four species collected between 1900 and 1907. And then subsequently much later, 1966 to 2012. And I think you can notice, you can see that all the birds on the right in each pair, the older one is much darker. So why do you think that is? and maybe I gave you the answer a little bit before, it's air pollution. It's actually carbon contamination in the air. So this was uh, a paper that was published, I think in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. It was very interesting and showed that this were birds were all from, I think, sort of the Rust Belt in that part of the country where there was a lot of industrial pollution early on. And this shows the progress we've made in terms of removing contaminants and what was really remarkable that was unique about using collections for this is there are no other data. There were no data on what the levels of carbon contamination were in these regions at these early times in the early part of the 20th century because nobody was measuring it, probably didn't have the tools and nobody was looking. And so by using the collections, we're actually filling in holes in the data. It's windows into the past that we wouldn't have otherwise. So they really collections are a treasure trove. Of, of discovery that that's many more will be made, I'm sure. So I'm gonna end there and say, this is a illustration of a Victorian cabinet of curiosities. And I hope that I've shown you that we've progressed beyond this and that the value of collections is, is truly uh, real and important. And I'm happy to take any questions, thanks. Thank you so much, Blair. Good. Wow. Oh, I'm good on time too. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we're doing great on time. That was so interesting. Thanks for sharing that with us. Sure. Um, let's see here. We've got uh, some questions already submitted. Um, how how are specimens collected? Um, do scientists look for dead animals or no. pull them from the wild? And similarly, someone's wondering if they find a dead bird. Do they donate it to a collection? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, mostly th there is some you know, roadkill and that sort of thing. They, those things sometimes end up in collections depending on how, uh, if they aren't too messed up. Um, but most of the scientific collecting is done systematically. So the birds are, they put up things called mist nets in the forest. Uh, they get up very early in the morning and they put up these mist nests, mist nets. <laughs> which capture the birds, but um, don't necessarily kill them. But then they, yeah. So sometimes people are doing this just to sample the birds and let them go. They'll like take a blood sample and that's much more common nowadays. But in the old days, I guess they caught them and then they killed them in some way. And I've never done that. So I can't tell you exactly whatever. I hope they did it the most humane way, quick way possible with mammals. Yeah, it, you know, they trapped them. It's mostly done with traps, um, but and yeah, that's the way it's usually done. If you do, I mean, you can donate like, unfortunately, like window strikes, like a lot of the dicky birds now, we get um, uh, collections sometimes from window strikes where the birds hit the glass, which is sad. But so at least if you can collect those and preserve them, they, you know, there's some value to that, to their life <laughs> and their loss. Um, 
but I don't think the Dickey collection is ready right now to collect take everybody's window strikes. But uh, if, if we get there after COVID and get back in action, maybe we could consider that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, what can you tell us about the people who use the collection? Are they mainly students? And if so, from what disciplines? Oh, well, a lot of, yeah, we have graduate students from the ecology and evolutionary biology department, or maybe from molecular biology, if they're getting a little more into something that has to do with organisms, but largely it's from the biology departments is where we get um, visitors. I think we have had, oh, yeah, we, uh, anthropology sometimes for, uh, you know, identifying specimens that they find in anthropological digs that they need to know what species it is. If they don't have it in the Fowler's um, zooarchaeology collection, they'll come to us. We work with them on that. Um, and we have scientists, yeah. So it's the students come in for teaching too. We have a portion of the collections that is used for teaching that has, you know, the students can handle more. A lot of it, we don't want lots of people having hands all over it, of course. Um, but there are, there's a portion that's a teaching collection that's used for teaching classes on mammals, classes on birds, all, all kinds of biology classes. So, yeah. And is there any um, effort to or value in digitizing such collections? Oh, yes. Yes, I didn't have time to go. That's the other big thing that besides the molecular biology revolution is the digitization. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So everything. Um, there's a NSF, National Science Foundation, has a number of initiatives to uh, fund digitization of collections. And we haven't uh, started that yet at UCLA, but I am interested in trying to you know, raise funds to be able to do that. But as you can see, T-scan specimens, um, skulls and bones and you know, all kinds of things, or you can just do the external morphology as well. And this is a there's a lot of that and they're big databases forming online called like MorphoBase and that are, people are adding all their specimens to these collections. So, I mean, to these digital collections. So it'd be, you won't have to go to the museum necessarily for everything in the future. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And is there any collaboration between UCLA and the Natural History Museum of LA with our respective collections? Um, we know about each other and yeah, we, we borrow, they borrow from us. Sometimes we borrow from them or my students will borrow from them if we don't have a specimen. Um, we, yeah, I'm an adjunct uh, uh, associate, research associate at the LA County Museum and one of their curators is in our adjunct professor in our department. So yes, we have uh, connections and work with them a lot actually, yeah. And so um, we're now wondering about preservation and taxidermy. Um, mm -hmm. Does the collection employ a taxidermist and how are these uh, specimens preserved? Right. So no, at the present time, we do not have somebody who is um, trained in preparing specimens though. Um, and we haven't had anybody like that for, you know, uh, 10 years or something like that. But I'm working on, we, uh, there's a new graduate student who is trained in doing this, and she may be running a sort of a class for some other uh, graduate students and others to, um, uh, to bring us up to speed on that front. But we don't have the funding really to hire somebody for that. So there are a lot of things we have in the freezer right now that would, um, a lot of those window strike birds and things that need to be prepared and integrated into the collection, but we're in a little bit of a lull, partially due to COVID and also, yeah, getting more funding, yeah. Okay, great, we still got several questions left. Um, are there any, well, you know, I'll say to this, the collection specific questions, um, how did the Dickey, and others get the items from their collections. How did they get them? Do they mean like, um, how did they collect them? So he, he was, yeah, there are photographs of him with rifles and things. So the mammals, I suppose he, he shot. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the birds, I imagine he used nets for collecting. I think that's been the traditional way to collect birds and bats as well um, for, forever. Yeah. So that's what they did. And they would just try to, you know, kill them as humanely and quickly as possible. Yeah. Are there any specimens from overseas locations or are they mostly from the U.S.? 
they're mostly from the US, but we have Central America as well represented and well, the Laysan Islands, which I guess they belong to maybe us. Those are out in the Pacific North of Hawaii. Uh, Dickie went there and he filmed albatrosses flying. It's his first films ever of albatrosses flying. And they were used, actually his movies of albatrosses flying were used by Howard Hughes. He, he, he had his engineers look at the films of the birds flying to model airplane wings. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great story, Betty. yeah. <laughs> And um, are there any variations being seen yet that are direct reflections of recent climate change? In the in our collection, uh, I'm sure there's evidence there, but nobody's nobody's used it to to study that. There have been other collections where I think they've noticed uh, changes in body size, uh, either smaller or larger. I'm trying to remember if, of a good climate change example. You really see maybe more of that in the plants than we're going to pick up in the animals. What they do, oh no, but they are seeing it because they're looking at like the times back to birds. See, I'm a mammal person mostly, so I think mammal instead of bird. But um, birds, the times when they arrive as they migrate, they're coming earlier and earlier, right, to the north and, and having their eggs and everything. And that can be tracked um, in some way. They can do this with birds and they can recognize that they are from uh, something in their morphology that they are coming earlier, or actually the dates at when they're seen and those sorts of things. So yeah, so they are, people are actively looking for this, but it's probably gonna be more in the birds than the mammals at this point, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Blair, for taking the time to share such fascinating information about all of the specimens and the way these collections work. Really appreciate you joining us today. Sure, thank you for inviting me again. Take care. And and thanks to everyone who joined us today. The program has been recorded. It's available on our Facebook immediately and then on our Instagram and on our website in the coming days for you to revisit and share. And we hope you'll join us for our next program this Thursday. You can find information on the closing slide. In the meantime, have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye.